Yes, we are live. It. Welcome to Masculinity Show. Got my guest here, Dr. Michael Robillard, Will Nolan, and Tim Gordon. And today we're going to be talking on the topic of women's place or not their place in the workplace and the fact that it's a woman's right to stay at home. And it's a man's responsibility to provide, especially if there are children involved. But I figured the best way to kick it off would be with this TikTok that I found today. It was on, uh, it was on Twitter. One of my uh, red pill friends posted it. And I thought it was pretty cool. This girl is absolutely atrocious, uh, cringeworthy from head to toe, uh, swears like a sailor. But is she wrong? I'll let you guys decide. We'll watch the video and then we'll uh, we'll comment and then proceed from there. That's right. We need to have a talk, you fucking bitch. Listen, this conversation is inspired by my marriage and family professor. Let's just talk about the fact that women, women, because women are the main uh, gender going through this thing called, oh, so I go to work. But when I come home from work, I have a second shift at home, right? Right, you have a second shift at home because you got married to somebody that, you know, you guys didn't have that conversation. And even if you guys have that conversation, eventually things are gonna fall onto the traditional patterns of life, which are for a woman to come home from work and work at home, do the home things, take care of the kids, cook, clean, organize, whatever the fucking case may be, have shit ready for the husband, right? Is that not right? Okay, and then there goes the man. Um, Cause you know, the, the lady starts complaining, like, listen, I'm fucking tired. I get home from work and I have a second shift at home. Second job. Oh, let's get to work again. Okay, she, uh, you know, expresses her feelings to her husband and then there goes the husband. Oh, I don't know. The man doesn't even enunciate, as my professor said. Oh my god, that shit literally made me like, ugh, in class. It's fucking disgusting. It's fucking disgusting. Bitch, you don't need, you can't even find a man. Listen, it's not even about you being able to find a man. It's the fact that these men will make it seem like they are the fucking man. They are the fucking hero of it all. When it comes to five, ten years into the relationship, where the fuck is the man that I married? You feel me? You do you feel me? Like do you fucking feel me? The, the man doesn't even fuck. All right, that's enough. I had enough. Hey, so <laughs> I figure the first reaction that I have is that well, she, she's a tough girl. She got a nasty mouth. She got those long nails. I'm quick to judge. I want to say I would never want to see my son with a girl like that, and I would advise every man to stay away. But is she wrong? As she started speaking, I couldn't help but to nod my head and say, yeah. The only thing is, well, one thing that stuck out to me was that she mentioned the traditional role of the woman. And my first reaction and even the comment that I put on Rich Cooper's post when he shared this was that there's nothing traditional about a working woman. Everything that she's complaining about is true in terms of needing to go out into the world and work and then come home and do the things that a woman's designed to do, that's meant to do, that loves to actually do. But if she's squeezing the juice out there, working for the man, and then has to come home and fulfill her duty, which it is her duty as the wife and mother and the woman of the home to care for the children and to care for the home, uh, there's going to be a lot of resentment. And so... I'll, I would like to open up just with a first gut reaction from my guest, and then we can dive a little bit more into uh, you know, where she's right and what the church has to say about women working outside the home and the responsibility of a man. Uh, it's, it's his duty to work outside the home. So, Tim, why don't we begin with you, man? What is your first gut reaction to our sweet little Latina girl with the nine-inch nails? First reaction, oh, uh, switch to decaffeinated and also coffee with less meth and Drano in it. But uh, uh, second reaction is she's she's not wrong. You know, I mean, she's not wrong at all. 
and I'm, I'm glad we're going to talk about the it really righteous anger that is is naturally consequent upon being told go into the workplace you know be free be liberated be independent uh by the way it's a kind of post puritanical joke on you know the american americans with the post protestant work ethic you get to go do this enjoy being a secretary now then you have to fit in all of the homemaking chores in the second half of the day so i I don't blame her, and I'm, you know what, I'd like to see, hopefully in more humble Christian terms, the same response from more women. I think this actually is the honest response when a woman comes home and realizes you've got the waning afternoon and twilight hours to do what takes the rest of the women who stay home all day to do. And I think the only reason we're not seeing that from more women is because I think they're just shirking on those home responsibilities. They're not doubling up and doing both. I think they're just shirking on those home responsibilities. If they were, you'd see more weird uh, Drano and meth and non-decaffeinated coffee infused uh, responses like this. <laughs> Amen, amazing. Michael, what are, your, what are your gut reactions, brother? Yeah, so the, uh, the first thing that came to mind listening to her was uh, the famous G.K. Chesterton quote that I have here, where he says, uh, feminism is mixed up with a muddled idea that women are free when they serve their employers, but slaves when they help their husbands. Right. So, you know, what, that, that's what I was hearing when she was talking about that. I, I also couldn't help notice that she was quoting her, her uh, family college professor that has all the answers here. So, whereas I think there is very much something that she's getting correct there about this uh, non-traditional uh, dynamic. She seems to be blaming the, the locus of everything. She seems to be blaming on men as opposed to the situation in general. So I think that that is uh, disproportionate. I think it, it needs to basically need to lead, but there needs to be a, a recognition that it's bo both sexes have got themselves collectively into this situation, especially with the feminist laws that were put forth to shove women out into the workforce and then feminize the workplace, making men uh, less uh, to be better producers and, and providers. So I think it's a, it's a two-way street uh, in that regard, but those are my first thoughts. And I would just add that, uh, you know, by flooding the workforce with women, all wages come down, so everybody's poorer as a result, so nobody wins mm -hmm. with women in the workplace. Will, reaction, brother? Mm -hmm. First thing I noticed was that she, she talks and gesticulates like a man. Mm. I don't know whether she's working herself, but that was a masculinized woman. And one of the reasons for that is when men aren't giving women the, the space, the protection to actually flourish into their femininity. They don't. And what Tim raised in his point was that this can lead to all kinds of resentment because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And my main thought there was that there is someone who should be doing the second shift and that's the man. So he's going out working, then he comes home, does his second shift because he's got the greater burden to bear. And if he gets that wrong, then there's going to be problems in the marriage. But yeah, what a bad situation to see someone in. So I remember a couple months ago, I was at a function with my wife, Colleen, and the, the conversation about homeschooling came up with another couple. And uh, they were both working people, but the husband looked to the wife and said, you know, I've been trying to get her to homeschool for so long, uh, maybe she should listen to your wife. And my wife immediately returned with, I don't work outside the home. Uh, this woman was a flight attendant, uh, they were both flight attendants, and for her to stay home would have been completely impossible, but yet the demand for homemaking, home caring, homeschooling was proposed to her by her husband. I'd like to be, start off this, I don't wanna say finger pointing game, but you know, responsibility game with where men have screwed up as a result of this. Where do you see most men uh, 
adopting wrong think in terms of women in the workforce and women uh, being a provider in the home. How, how, how did men adopt this or fall into this error? And uh, you know, what are some of the most common uh, misconceptions that men just carry around in terms of women working? Well, I, I would jump in and say that like a lot of American leftism or perhaps the whole of American leftism, there's a post-Protestant uh, flavor to what's happened with the sacralization of the workplace that got sort of uh, reduplicated, weaponized, and charged up politically um, when, it, when feminism took over. So, of course, I, I alluded to this earlier. In America, which was a, a Puritan country, not even so much an, an Anglican country, not a Catholic country by demographics in the beginning, there was something called the, the Protestant work ethic, where the uh, quotidian, the daily graces of the sacraments, was substituted because they didn't have that. Of course, they'd gotten rid of that in the Protestant Reformation, and, and they jettisoned what is Catholic in, in terms of how we like touch bases with daily grace, the sacraments. And instead, they were getting their sense of daily grace from labor. This is mm. particularly important in American Calvinism. So uh, the typical image would be the, the cobbler over his, I'm using the words of Baxter, huddled over his work. And this is his connection with a sacrament is, oh. uh, you know, your, your vocation is laboring. And the Catholics were quick to point out this is wrong, not just for women. You know, women didn't work back then, but for men. Of course, our vocation as lay men lays in for matrimonies or a daily sacrament. The, the, the marital act is the way you refresh that. And with the Eucharist and with confession, these are the three kind of ongoing three of seven sacraments that we're in touch with is Catholic laymen. This is how we keep rapport up with daily grace. Well, the Protestants do it by saying, well, your vocation isn't the alternative to the cloth, to ordained life, you know, your wife and your children. Your vocation is your, and you hear this very commonly in America. A lot of Catholics borrow from this terminology by saying, oh, my, my vocation, I felt called to being a dentist. You're not called to be a dentist. God doesn't care what a man does. I'm not trying to sound like Vito Corleone, but anything honest, anything moral will suffice. More successful or less successful, what you're called to do as a man is to you know, win daily bread and then come home and teach, play, pray with your family that's really your job, but you do have to put food on the table. It doesn't matter what you do. Mother Teresa said, you're not called to be successful, you're called to be faithful. So you could choose to do something more humble or something less humble. Either way, it's not your vocation. This all seemed to seep into the first wave feminist movement. Starting in 1848, there was a lot of Puritanism involved in it. And it's the Protestant work ethic, which like all inversions, subversions, perversions of, of true Christian teaching, Roman Catholicism, it was very easy to contort into an extra bad false view of, of labor, feminist false view of labor. But it's ironic because feminists think they're anti-Puritanical and they, they borrow so much from the, the Puritan's view of work that it's really sacralizing. And you, you could tell when you listen to a feminist talk about work, not, not this young lady that we think of today's show, she has a more honest view. But they talk about work like it's a sacrament. It's like, what job are you going to? I'm a man. It's my curse as part of the curse of Adam to deal with. And I hate it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing that you describe it as a sacrament because growing up, that's the first question someone asks, right? Like as a kid, what are you going to be when you grow up? And it always has something to do with how you're going to earn money. I'm going to be a cowboy or an astronaut or a, some sort of a labor, but it's never to be a husband or to be a father. Well, I think I hear you saying, which I think is the position of the church, is that our, ver our first vocation is in the family. 
Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Will, Mike, anything to add to uh, the idea that, uh, that, w that it's somehow um, empowering and righteous for women to work from a man's perspective? I, I just uh, pick up on what I Tim said there. This with respect. Oh, sorry, Mike, you go. Roger, yeah, but it's a delay. Yeah, I was just thinking about this with respect to my old first, my first job as a military officer, and the the absolute detriment to unit cohesion that uh, mixed uh, sex units uh, create. It's it's the number one unit killer. Uh, I, I've, I've just fortunately when I was downrange, I was in an all male unit, but I've heard nothing but horror stories uh, about just the. The rampant, you know, sexual nonsense, sexual opportunity for sexual harassment, uh, you know, mis miscommunication of of um, uh, signals between men and women downrange, men uh, unnecessarily sacrificing themselves or, or putting themselves in riskier situations, consciously or subconsciously to uh, protect, to naturally protect the the female or female. Uh, so I think when this ethic translates to the, not just the producer areas of, um, male spaces, but the protector roles as well, it gets very dangerous and people die. Uh, look at the Jessica Lynch, uh, rescue mission, right? You, you originally this story, uh, when Jessica Lynch was, uh, her unit was overrun, she jumped up there on the, uh, on the saw and was, um, was, you know, fighting you know, rocking the machine gun fighting uh, against the uh, the forces that attacked them. In reality, that wasn't what happened at all. And then it required a, a special forces unit to go in and, and uh, rescue her. Um, so, I mean, this is what happens when you have mixed gendered units. It, the unit effectiveness, unit cohesion goes drastically down and it's a threat to fighting force. So, I mean, that's, I think, a, a hyper um, example of what goes wrong here you said gender mike <laughs> I just sorry it's choppy <laughs> will go me. ahead yeah so uh, picking up on what tim said you can really see how deeply people have drunk of that mm -hmm. when someone asks you like what do you do and you brush over the question and kind of dismiss it in a couple of seconds because uh, you're not your job. And if you don't ask someone what they do at a drinks party or something, that can really kill the conversation because it's the only thing some people have to talk about because their work is them. And what I've yeah. found having had stay at home wife since she was 19, 20 with our first kid, some people just can't comprehend that you've got an identity that isn't linked to the workplace as a woman. And, oh, to, but she's got a degree. Didn't, didn't she use her degree? Yeah, in forming her mind and in teaching her kids. But there's no need for that to be used in the workplace. I'd regard myself as a failure as a man if my wife had to sit through some diversity training seminar in the workplace. That would be as embarrassing to me as if someone came up and punched her in the face. So people talking about being a protector, you need to get it in the moral sense as well as just the physical sense. Like, well, yeah, I, I train MMA and I practice with my guns, but my wife works and she has to sit through diversity training. You're not being a protector. <laughs> and why does this happen? Because it's, a lot of people fall into this because it's easier in the first place. So the man thinks, great, less pressure on me. I haven't got to work as hard to bring in as much money. He sees the dollar signs of the extra paycheck and thinks that this is going to be an improvement for the household overall. And let's be honest, for women as well, the workplace can be easier than the home. Kids can be difficult if you're with them all day. They bring all kinds of challenges that a keyboard and just sending emails doesn't. So for both sexes, it can be escapism. But the easy way isn't necessarily the good way, and people are finding that out the hard way. Hmm. Um, so back in 2003, uh, I got married. We had our first child, Colleen and I. 
And I knew nothing of this right. It's a woman's right to stay at home. It's so funny because, you know, right now it seems almost as if it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, how you would say a luxury for women to stay home, but it was her right. You know, I was a personal trainer, not making very much money. My wife has a higher degree than me. She was working as a school teacher, making more money than me. She had uh, uh, health insurance and things of that nature. But out of the love of my heart for my child, I just couldn't imagine sending her to daycare. And so, you know, it wasn't a matter of giving my wife her due as a mother. It was more a matter of how to create the most resourceful environment for my children to be raised in. I'm curious, you know, uh, Mike kind of fell off there for a moment. I'll try to get him back. But Will and Tim, you guys are, are both family men married with children. When and where did you make the decision to keep your wife at home and to be the sole provider for your family? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, if you can hear me, I'll, uh, I'll jump in here. For me, the decision was there long before I got fully red pilled about all of the tentacles of feminism, you know, seeing how vastly, uh, encroaching they were in all domains of life. I, I always hated feminists, but I didn't always know that they ran everything you know, and that, that feminism was the beating heart of, of leftism and even the original sin. But I remember, yeah, when we, when my wife and I got married, she stayed home and, um, you know, she was, Steph was going to college classes by day. I was teaching college classes. So she'd kind of just go to the classes a little bit by day. I taught night classes. So she'd go pick a class at the time. She's going somewhat nonchalantly, casually. And I didn't want her to have to go to a job by day. Now, I think she worked because we weren't, she never wanted to work and I never wanted her to work. But I think when we decided to go to Italy for me to pursue my PhD, she worked a job uh, for, for a family friend for a couple of months, like 15 hours a week, uh, just to earn like a small sum of cash. And we were like, that, that was really unpleasant, even working for the family friend and that, that doesn't really work. And this is why you haven't, you haven't worked by design for the last year and a half. When we got to Italy, um, I worked an amazing job teaching English to Italian aristocrats. <laughs> and I got to go all around Rome and um, teach at five or six different offices this, this uh, business called Shanker had. So, once I realized I was, go I was seeing more of Rome doing that, Steph again started working with me 10 hours a week, you know, instead of just being at home in the apartment. And, and that, that was actually, I'm not gonna lie, that was really fun because we'd always get sent to the same Schenker office and I'd go teach like an Italian judge and she'd go teach an Italian lawyer in one room. So we weren't, we weren't like dogmatically against it. And if we talk about what the actual teaching of Christianity, the codified teaching of the church is, Technically, that's not violating it. I mean, because we were, she was doing it to be with me more of the day. Because I'd, I'd go to work, then I'd go to university. Right. But um, the the catechetical teaching is that a woman should love to remain at home, and it's it's not just a mother, but it's a wife. A married woman should love to remain at home, and she should ask her husband's permission to go out of the house during the day. Uh, when I first said this, Trent Horn, Trent Horn, and his wife Matt Frad and his wife have been having a bit of fun sort of in their error, taking, taking pot shots at, at uh, our, our books on this recently, but it's, it's turning around on them because it seems the popular culture is even getting into a position where it would be with us. We did not expect this when we started writing books on, uh, I have one, my wife has one, on what, what the church actually teaches. And it's also what the state of nature teaches. So even though she originally worked a couple nonchalant jobs, it was never a necessity. It was only a few hours a week. And, and we wouldn't have her do this now once we realized how bad it was. But I, I'm not a propagandist. It was, it was fun having her do it in Rome. Um, 
Tim, I'll stick with you for a moment uh, before I'm moving on to Will. So there are some guys that are listening right now that are like, yeah, you know what? I would love to create a situation where my wife stays at home or maybe when I get married. How how difficult was that? What were some of the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them when most families are, you know, they have two incomes? In all honesty, the one the the hardest year we ever had, the hungriest year we ever had was last year of law school because of course my my daughter got uh, was born kind of sick in Italy. I gave up the PhD, went to law school. And um you know, that that was difficult to make work without have, sending Steph into the workplace, but it was never an option at that point. I'd become more serious about following Christian teachings and was learning about that stuff then. But uh, ironically, it was actually the first year after law school where I, I did my only year working as a first year uh, pre-bar attorney in a fancy law firm that was so underpaid. Don't, don't go to law school, people. Uh, that it was a, a legal downturn in the market. I was so underpaid that we were, we were really, we were hungry. We had all these credit card bills from law school. And if we w ever would have been tempted to have Steph work, it would have been then. And we weren't even tempted. It wasn't even an inkling in our mind. I ended up getting my old job back from before Italy and before I went to law school in San Diego. As a high school teacher, and I was making nearly twice what they'd paid me before when I went back because they, they appreciated all the degrees. And um, I got a raise to go from working 60-hour law firm weeks to 30-hour uh, high school teacher weeks on block schedule. So it's kind of like being a college professor. It was quite amazing. Uh, my, my boss of the law firm was like, hey, do they have a job for me there too? Of course, he was being dramatic because he made a lot of money and didn't pay me any. But the point is... I. We always made it fine on a school teacher's salary, starting from that point onward, uh, much better than on a lawyer's salary. And we were never, ever, ever even tempted to have Steph work. Uh, and not that we had been in the first place, but there were the conditions for the possibility of us being tempted to have Steph work were not even there. Because even though it was California, and by the time I went back to teaching high school, I think we had four kids, then five, six, seven. But, you know, before all the things that happened to me happened and I moved out here, it, it, was, it was a fine salary, a single salary. I mean, you really only need one functional car, folks, when, when the wife doesn't work. When you homeschool, right. you're not putting extra miles on any car. You, if you homeschool and your wife stays home, you really seriously don't need that other car. You don't need the other gas. It's, it's, a, it's a very lovely home economy because the home is bustling during the day. It's the center of industry for your family. And you can lovingly leave the wife and kids sort of tucked in and go off to work and face, like Will says, not only the actual uh, physical moral uh, dangers of being out in the world, but the, the moral ones and the cultural ones as well. So... We made it fine on a school teacher's salary in California, arguably the most expensive state, as I went from three kids to four to five to six to seven. And um, if you budget, there should be no problem whatsoever in functioning on a single income salary. One, one final note, the reason I think we didn't get more support from my people who are supposed to be the trad Catholics for books like mine and especially for Steph's Ask Your Husband, is because a lot of trads, even though they talk a good game, they bought into the lie that, yeah, every household really needs two incomes. And so right. they're bitter, they're angry because they bought into the lie. And then you have Tim and Steph Gordon telling everyone, no, here's the church teaching on this. You're not supposed to have, not only in the state of nature, but according to the dictates of Holy Mother Church, you're not supposed to have more than one breadwinner. Amazing, thank you, Tim. Uh, Will, when and how did you decide that it would be right for your wife to stay at home and for you to be the, uh, the sole breadwinner? And what were some of the challenges you faced? So I wasn't raised Christian, never taken to church or anything like that. And I was married with kids, three, by the time I was in my early 20s, 22, 23. And I'd figured out 
without looking at church teaching that the wife at home was the best thing for the children. So similar to you, Elliot, when you've got that choice between making sacrifices so that your wife can spend time with the kids, because what woman is going to regret extra time with her kids when it comes to the end of her life versus wishing she hadn't meant, uh, spent as much time in the office? That's an obvious one. You do the right thing, even if it involves having to work longer hours initially. But I've actually found that you don't need anywhere near as much money to make it work as people imagine. And one of the excuses is, oh, no, I can't do that because I've got these bills to pay or whatever it might be. Now, you might have to take a small cut in terms of your material standard of living, but it's really going to be a lot smaller than you might imagine because most of that extra money that a woman's going to get by working is going to go on childcare anyway. Then you've got the extra clothes right. to work, the travel to work, etc. She's not bringing home this big extra stash of disposable income for you guys to spend on, was it going to be a holiday or an extra car or whatever? And you need to prioritize the spiritual welfare of, um, actually it's everyone. It's not only hers, but it's yours too, because it's better for you to have a stay-at-home wife spiritually. It's better for her and it's better for the kids. And these are all far more valuable things than having a tiny bit extra disposable income that comes at far too great a price. So it was difficult financially initially when I was in my early 20s. But looking back on it now, those were really great years and I wouldn't change anything about them. And when I lost my job and my house, when I was back from Eton, it was a big worry to me because a lot of that was taken away all at once and I was self-employed for the first time. But still, my number one concern was no matter what happens, uh, my wife is not going to have to work because I know that has to be the main thing I get right going forwards from this. And I'll drive a truck or I'll go and do manual labor like I used to when I was in my 20s. But that's the one thing that's not happening because that's more important to me as a man than whatever salary I might get. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, you and I are kind of in the same boat in that regard. I remember there were times when business was very difficult. I mean, business comes and goes as well. Uh, but I, I said that I would go pick oranges. You know, I'm here down in Florida and we got migrant workers. I was willing to pick up a, a, a bucket and a shovel and go dig ditches if I had to. You know, of course, it never came to that. But whatever it would take to keep my children's mother at home and not have to send them out to be indoctrinated by daycare or anything of that nature. Amazing. Um, so, Mike, uh, you're self-employed, right? Uh, the, the, the four of us are self-employed. Uh, let's talk to that for a moment. You know, I asked the other two guys about, uh, you know, providing for families, but uh, I figured for you it would be a good place to begin the conversation on what what it, what kind of inspiration did you have and what steps did you take and what challenges did you overcome in order to become not just, you know, a, a working man, uh, a provider, but a self-employed man, which kind of takes it to the next level. Uh, a little bit about your entrepreneurial uh, journey. You're breaking up for me. Uh, are, are, the, are you guys uh, hearing same. Mike well? No, no, nah. he's, yeah, he's, he's way he's skipping. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's, it's not coming in at all. It's like just breaking up. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, let's see if we can get that squared up. I'll just pass the mic to, to Tim and Will. Now, both you guys were working. And this is even, you know, I would say scarier. Not that you guys are scared dudes. You're courageous men. But you knew what it was like to collect a paycheck. You both got fired because of your views. Uh, you were canceled. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You know, you've got, you've got children to feed. You've got a wife at home that's depending on you. Um, what, what kind of shifts happened in your, in your mind and in your soul when you knew you had to go and do it on your own now? You can't really even rely on the system. Well, the funny thing is that this, this happened to me and Will consecutively in, uh, very, in the short span of 
a, a few months. It was, uh, of course, 2020, in the midst of all the madness of late 2019, 2020. And I had already had a successful run as a podcaster and live streamer with, with Taylor Marshall. Mm -hmm. It was well known, very well known at that point. And I was the theology department chairman at a California Catholic school for the people that don't know. So everything I did was kind of high profile. It was a politically conservative area, but it was theologically inchoate. The, the Catholics there didn't know, even if the parents of the students of the school were political conservatives, they didn't get mad when I'd say something about uh, abortion or, I don't know, marriage between uh, two of the same sex. They would get mad, though, when I would talk about feminism mm -hmm. uh, with regard to their, the, the, their young girls. Like, hey, you know, train to be a mommy. That's the kind of stuff that made them mad because conservatives have been infiltrated by this. So the only areas that I would really get in trouble um, and keep talking was on the issues that were uh, leftist incursions into conservatism, which formed a conservative blind spot. At the time, in the summer of 2020, which is when I got fired, I wasn't even working. I was tweeting about Black Lives Matter that it's a, a terrorist organization, as the FBI designated a black identity extremist group in, in 2017. I also made a joke, which I want to do, about Father James, James Martin S.J. And I, I think I made a joke about Islam, and those were the three tweets that they cited when they, when they fired me. And, of course, I kind of already could, could pivot to what I'd been doing for a year and a half, two years at that point, which was live streaming, podcasting, and that's what I did. When I, I moved here, I knew I wanted to get out of the state anyway. And, and you know, it's funny because when Will's story happened, um, he, he made a similar pivot. And I think I had him on my show right away. I was like, this is like the, the British Tim Gordon. Isn't that right, Will? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, so... Yeah, I've got a bit of a delay, but I'll, I'll hop in now. So when I spoke to Tim for the first time, um, although actually my wife had played him and Taylor Marshall in the background um, in our home while I was popping in and out when I was working at college. So I'd heard his voice before I knew of him. When I spoke to him before, I felt like I'd known him for a long time because of going through a similar situation for similar reasons. And you got to realize if there are any guys out there thinking, well, oh, what if I get fired for telling the truth or speaking my mind about something? The stakes are pretty high for you if you consent to lies to try and keep a job. And there's no happy ever after by doing that. It's for your spiritual good and the spiritual good of your neighbor as well that you speak the truth. So that's an important thing to really take on board. What are you expecting if you don't? Are you hoping for some kind of safety and security? No, because that sort of Damocles is always going to be hanging over you. Like if it hadn't been those tweets that got Tim, it would have been the next one. Or it would have been some student reporting it for something in class. There's no way to spend a life, two decades, three decades, and calling that a career when you've been biting your tongue the whole time. You end up losing your spine, losing your balls, and that's bad for your wife, bad for your whole family, bad for yourself, it dishonors God. So you're much better off just trusting the market and your own skills and the fact that people have a hunger for the truth now because there's so few people willing to speak it. And that's the situation I've found myself in. I still love teaching literature, and that can be done sometimes with some writers in a non-controversial way. But look, I'm sorry, most of the classic works that have stood the test of time, they say things about human nature that are true and hurt and go against the dominant ideology today because of that. So you can't teach Jane Austen or Shakespeare properly and keep your job in these places anymore. So my job had already vanished while I was in it. And that's why I was out of it, because why stay? Right, absolutely. And so what kind of, uh, well, we spoke about this already, but you know, the challenge associated with taking that 
you know, taking that and running with it and making it work for you as a self-employed man. Um, let's move to Mike real quick because he's back. Uh, Mike, just a little bit about your journey as a self-employed man, you know, because we're talking about being providers and the fact that it is a man's responsibility and a woman's right to be at home. But the four of us have taken it, you know, one step further by venturing out and working for ourselves. And I think that might be helpful to some of the guys listening. Um, a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Right, right. Uh, can you hear me uh, decently? Yeah, and you look clearer than you've ever looked before. I don't know what you're using right now, but it's the best All one right, yet. <laughs> um, okay, stop. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, my story, I came from two very large perennial institutions, the military and, and academia. So, you know, when I left the military, my goal was to be, uh, was to be Mr. Keating from Dead Poets Society. I, I had no entrepreneurial uh, uh, ideas, you know, or, or uh, you know, desire to strike out on my own. I trusted the institution. I thought, you know, I, I want to get accredited and legitimized within this perennial institution, get a job at a college somewhere, and, and that will be my, my life. Uh, but listening to what Will was saying at the end there, essentially what happened to me, it wasn't so much inspiration, but desperation that, that drove academia because, yeah, the, the walls were completely closing in and I felt like my, my soul was shrinking every time I had to sit there and be complicit with people saying not just things that I disagreed with, but things that I couldn't in principle agree with. They were just overt lies. And uh, that will, there's no amount of money in the world that I would take to, to have to sit there and nod my head and silently go along with such stuff. I mean, that's, just, that's the type of stuff that will, it'll kill your soul, it'll kill your mind, it'll kill your heart, it'll kill every, every fiber of your masculinity mm. to sit there and to have to go along with abject falsehoods, to have to say, yes, the emperor does have uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful clothes. Uh, so for me, yeah, I, I didn't have a plan. Uh, I just, I had to pull the ripcord and, uh, you know, I would just say the, you know, fortunately, you know, by God's grace and by, uh, the help of other like-minded people, audiences and, and, um, members like yourself, you know, I've, there's, I was able to, to be, um, there's something that caught me. And, you know, a year later, I'm, I'm on Tucker Carlson today in, in a one hour interview, you know, telling my story. And, uh, you know, who knew? You know, I never knew that was going to happen uh, when I made that that leap. Um, but, yeah, I would just reiterate the point that Will was making there is that it's not safe at all uh, to stay uh, in the, the a job that has been captured by woke tyrannical um, forces. So you're going to have to make the decision at one point to, to go against the grain or to go with it. And it, there's no safety in, in going with it. It just means you're going to get eaten by the monster later on uh, as a coward, as opposed to, to standing up and, and at least try, trying to make something work on your own. Uh, and there's no certainty, uh, but at least, you know, there is, there is certainty in having virtue in, in your efforts. Amazing. Thank you. You know, you were bouncing around a little bit, but I thought about this. You know, Mike, you're a, a huge history expert. You know, you know a lot about history. Uh, Tim mentioned earlier, um, you know, Protestant work ethic was a part of what sort of parlayed into this women working in the uh, being in the workforce. And we take it for granted today. I mean, for the most part of the 20th century, if you would or the late 20th century, if you would even uh, question this, people think that you're crazy. Even like when we kept Colleen home back in 2003, most of our friends and our family were like, what is she going to do? How are you going to make money? How are you going to live? So it's, it's sort of counter culture. It wasn't always this way. Are you familiar with, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, the Federal Reserve Bank and their uh, plot, if it's true, you know, this is, I'm kind of asking you, but was it true that it was the intention to create more taxpayers in the United States uh, to, uh, to, to, in order to create more taxpayers, they pushed this feminist ideal of, you know, strong, independent women in the workforce? Did, did we lose you again, Mike? Oh, man. <laughs> 
Uh, Tim, anything to add to that? You have? Are you familiar? Or are you are you aware of what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm, well, I've I've always heard the theory. It's plausible because the federal government was was pushing feminism all throughout the 20th century. They want every shekel they can get their grubby paws on. So why not? I don't. I've never looked into the details, but remember, remember, it's consistent with what I do know about the history of feminism, Elliot, because. First wave feminism had all of the same thorns that all feminism has. You know, it's, it's actually a, a phlebotomy to distinguish between first, second, third, fourth wave feminism. I now talk about a fifth wave feminism, which is this extra nefarious Christian feminism. First wave feminism began in 1848. It was pushed by leftist dissenting Protestants, largely, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And so by the time you get to the uh, ratification of the Federal Reserve, it had been in the water for like 70 years mm. and was being pushed by the federal government strongly after the Civil War closed up. But I, I, I would say, yeah, so I, I would say I find it wholly plausible. The, the most interesting thing is that's that's related but not directly on point since I don't know Exactly. I, I couldn't substantiate it in fine detail aside from saying I'm, I'm certain that you're right. Is like the, the Protestant, the, the dissenting Protestants out of that Puritan tradition of work is sacralizing and holy. Those like Elizabeth Cady Stanton realize because Christianity is so averse, even if we're just talking about Bible believing Protestants who aren't liberal, chapter and verse to women being out of the house and working, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who ran the Seneca Falls Convention, said, we have to write a new Bible for women. Did you know that? We have to write a woman's Bible really? so that women can work. Yeah, she said, look, no, no feminist, no first wave feminist can believe in the Bible of Moses and of Jesus, that God spoke to men because... <laughs> If you believe what God said inerrantly in the Christian Bible, then it destroys feminism. It says that uh, man is the glory of God, woman is the glory. It says women must be in the home time and time and time and time again. So she wrote a whole new Bible and she said she's, even though she was taken to be a Protestant, she is not one. She, there must be a woman's Bible and, and it's, the admissions are there all over first wave feminists feminism, which uh, today's cucked conservatives doff the cap to as if first wave feminism is somehow good. It is the most noxious. It's also the most honest of all the waves of feminism. So yeah. it being in the water for, for decades before the commission of the Federal Reserve, absolutely, I would bet everything I own that as a psyop, the ultimate psyop, more than transgenderism or, or Skittles, <laughs> it, it's it's how they destroyed every American family to the tune of you know twice the the uh, federal taxpayers. So you bet, you bet. Will is there a threat of communism uh, involved with women working in the uh, outside of the home? Yeah, for sure, because they want to attack the family. But one thing Mark said about. Uh, marriage being abolished and women being subject to a general and universal prostitution is really interesting when you think about what women working does to men's access to sex. There's a study by Baumeister and Mendoza in 2011, I've just pulled up here, and they look at a high sample of countries and they find that the economic and political liberation of women is positively correlated with greater availability of sex. So it's interesting. You get oh. more women into the workplace and it's easier for men to get sex. And this is another one of those ways in which feminism is like a honey trap because mm -hmm. it gives men more of what they think they want in the short term, but actually it ends up much worse for them in the long term, men and women. So why does this work then? Well, when women are mainly dependent on men as providers because they're not working for themselves, they tend to be quite careful about who they have sex with. But 
if the woman has got her own income and she's a boss babe and she don't need no man, then she's a bit freer with it. She's not guarding it as jealously. So it's a really overlooked fact that you get more women working, men can get sex more easily. So this is one of those prongs of attack where you use men's lust against them to weaken the monogamous marriage as the traditional spine of society. And that's how you can bring about cultural revolution. So I think that's a factor that we haven't fully discussed, um, the way in which sex is like a kind of economic marketplace and giving women jobs can radically alter it in the way that the feminists were wanting. Would you say that it also leads to infidelity and uh, the instance of divorce? Yeah, because the uh, apart from porn, which is way up there, um, the other leading cause of divorce or the leading correlate is the woman out earning the man. Mm. So as, as the woman's income goes up relative to the man, the risk of divorce goes up and the risk of impotence as well. So the guys who like the idea of the wife earning, if you push that far enough, if you set her on that road far enough, it ends in you being impotent and you getting divorced. <laughs> so I would just say, don't even start walking down that road. Not to wow. mention, not to mention, th this is wholly overlooked by today's uh, back pushers. I even myself, I'm guilty of this. Against feminism, Fun society was fundamentally changed by moving women into commercial intercourse. It was fundamentally changed in the sense that whereas women, before they had jobs, which sounds more technical than it is. It just meant that they weren't out and about in the marketplace during the day. Men were out and about, like if you watch a movie from the early 1960s, before the sexual revolution, and women were at home, uh, baking bread, cooking, cleaning, whatever. People tend to know that, but they don't know the adverse effect of having women in the workplace. Like it, it's something like a school where, where Will and I worked. They, they were always hammering you over the head, administration. Don't, don't be alone in a room with a student. You know, don't let the door slam behind them. If it's between classes and it's a passing period and a student wants to talk to you, which is normal and, and non-awkward, and everyone else lets the door slam and it's a female student asking about the homework, you know, go before you answer her question, go prop up the door. It's stupid. Because me and that female student have something to talk about, her homework. I was always forgetting to do that, to prop open the door. I'm like, this is normal. You know what was not normal? Anytime a, a female teacher, which is like 80% of teachers, would come in my classroom, then I felt awkward as hell with the door shut. I'm like, I, I'm not, it's not natural for women to be in the workplace, clogging things up and coming in there. Uh, I remember even, even, you know, the middle-aged and older women that would come in there, get in your face. It's like, well, I need my space. This is much more awkward than even having a female student asking me for 30 seconds about homework. And of course, admin will say nary a word about that. Think about that. The actual, what could be a real impediment to marriage if you're not extra careful. And many of the, the men who are in places like schools, working with women in general, are not extra careful. That's a far greater impediment, a far greater threat to incautious men's marriage than something like a, a student. And of course, the administration will never mention it. It fundamentally altered the face of society to have women in the workplace. That's why you have things like HR departments, guys, is because women are sensitive. They go into the workplace. They're being sexually harassed. Now it's no longer a place where men can make jokes and be efficient and, and act like men. It's now a unisex workplace. It's now a unisex forum that has been destroyed by the introduction of women from the home place into the workplace. It's, it's, it, that part needs to get talked about more. We saw how it was weaponized also during the Me Too movement. And I'm not excusing men that may have done inappropriate things, but the whole point then was that it became a means by which it was derogatory towards men. It was a, it was a strike against men all because women are in the workplace. Um, 
I want to kind of backtrack for a second with what Will was talking about in terms of the sexual dynamics in the home. Uh, I heard this saying, and I'm just throwing this out there. I'm sure you guys will agree, but it's just a statement that um, a, a wealthy man will lift up a poor woman. He will bring her into his life and, and joyfully, gladfully give his wealth to her and lift social status. But a wealthy woman won't even look <laughs> at a poor man. So if a woman's making six figures, if a man is making, say, $90,000, he's in, even though he's doing well comparatively to other men, he's unattractive to women. And so that shows you right there that, th that men and women aren't equal, we're not the same, and that the dynamics are destroyed by having women not just work but make money than men. Yeah. And on, the, on a level where even if the parties concerned won't recognize it theoretically or won't recognize it in black and white on paper, their bodies, their psyches still know it. Like, we're not that different from how human beings were in the Stone Age. Like, things don't change. And the woman is looking for stability and protection and provision in the husband of her children, rightly so. And if she senses that that relationship is off, and it's a real, to be honest, indicator that the hierarchy the relationship of authority between the two of them that she craves is off, then that's going to be a big turnoff. It's very politically incorrect what you find in the studies, but it's true. Right. We can't beat nature. So I have a couple uh, chats here that I want to just acknowledge. Um, Bill Arguenta uh, has a lot of disagreements and uh, you, I would love to air them. So one, he says here, women staying at home for preschool with a child or middle school is, is different. Kids are in school all day. What do you say to people who would argue that, well, what is a woman to do if a man is out working and the kids are at school, she's going to be bored. She's going to look for trouble. I've even heard a lot of red pill guys say that, look, you don't want to have a stay at home wife because she's going to be screwing the pool boy. Oh, well, how do you respond to that? How, how come they've only got a kid who's grown up in his high school age and no other kids? Are they using contraception? The family <laughs> should be big. Like, right. This doesn't make any sense. So right. um, I'm, I'm, my seventh kid's being born in about seven, eight weeks, and the eldest is 17. So I, it doesn't make any sense to me, this scenario. Something's gone wrong here. It's not natural. Right. If she's bored, she needs more babies. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll handle the, the, the front end, chronologically speaking, since Will handled the back end. After you have your first kid, you should just have more kids. But, but front-wise, what does a woman do before she has her first baby, once she's married? How much time do you have? Uh, so aside from just cooking, cleaning, we're talking baking, sewing, knitting. They're different things, uh, folks. Keeping a journal, reading, praying, gardening, getting into any other random hobbies, I don't know, field hockey, whatever she wants. These are the things that life is made of. When, when folks ask me this, I always ask them back, were you that loser kid that hated your summers off from, from the school years? Because right. I always hated those kids that, that were like, what are we going to do in the summer? Whatever you want. That's like some loser saying, what, asking their boss, what am I supposed to do on the weekend? How am I supposed to occupy my time? You work for the weekend. And women who are at home before they've had children have, and I don't want to diminish it, but it is like a weekend because they're the little bosses of their home when their husband's not there. And again, Steph, I'll just tell you what my wife does. She gardens, she knits. She just had a women's summit and she knitted a little personal piece, a little little trophy for every single woman that she invited on. Uh, uh, drawing, she's into art. Cooking, cleaning, baking. Try baking new things. It takes a long while. Mm -hmm. uh, beautifying the home, decoration, uh, searching things, researching. My wife read, by the way, uh, the entire Old Testament during Lent. Now she's flying through the New Testament. Amazing. You're a loser if you don't know what to do in your off time. Thanks for wow. the question. Wow. Great answers, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, I would just uh, also add that inherent in the question is the answer. 
Um, if your children are in school all day, then you have to ask yourself why. If your wife is at home, she should be teaching your high school and middle school children. That'll keep her busy and it will avoid perpetuating the issue that we're in right now, right? It's the school systems that indoctrinate our boys and girls into these um, unresourceful roles in society. So get the kids at home and she'll be busy. Yeah. Here's another one from uh, Philip. And he says, this is backwards thinking. Sometimes women make more money than men. There are women who have desires other than to be a housewife. Your kids will leave at the age of 20 and you will be a housewife doing what? Let me chime in real quick before I pass the mic. So again, inherent in the question is the answer. So women making more money than men. Well, that again is something that we had approached before. Why are you marrying a woman that makes more money than you, first of all, and most women aren't going to be attracted to a man that she makes less money than. So that's sort of a hypothetical question that doesn't arise very often. Women aren't attracted to men that make less money than them. So that question doesn't fly. There are women who have desires other than to be a housewife because they've been perverted by the school systems, the media and the music and so forth. So that is a byproduct of our diabolical disoriented age. Uh, women desiring other than that which they were most designed and pleased to do is a perversion. So you got two perversions right there. And then you say your kids will leave at age 20 and then your housewife will do what? Well, Tim answered that with the amazing amount of things that life has to provide and offer in terms of activities in the home. But I would also add that as a husband, you can keep your wife busy. If you are self-employed, you can give her tasks that she, my wife takes pride in the little tasks that I give her for my business. She does some bookkeeping, maybe once a month she'll do that. Actually, she's with my accountant right now um, and answer some emails. Not only does it give her something to do to keep her busy, but at the same time, she, it elevates her sense of self, her self-esteem. She can speak in terms of our business when she speaks to her friends. So if your wife is bored, it's because you're not giving her enough stuff to do. Me too, Tim. Elliot. By the mm -hmm. way, I don't even know how to run the tag. So on these Friday mornings, unlike when I run my podcast three times a week, all I, I, you know, since you guys send a link, I can actually turn the computer on. That was a big step forward for me, turning the computer on and going to the, the link. I let Steph sleep in these days. But um, yeah, she, I, she knows how to do everything. She makes, she makes the commercials for the channel. She makes the thumbnail. She, she gets everything going. So it's, it's the exact same thing. They help, help with the tasks. Help is too small a word in my case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's... Uh important to do and it, it gives the wife an, an insight into what you're doing to provide for the family as well especially if you work from home there's a, a great sense of partnership there uh, yeah. the anthropologist margaret mead has a great line that answers this question she says women may be said to be mothers unless they are taught to deny their childbearing qualities society must distort their sense of themselves pervert their inherent growth patterns perpetuate a series of learning outrages on them hmm. and in this situation here what you've actually got is a man who needs to educate the woman out of needs to disabuse her of those learning outrages that have made her think that her true identity or creativity is going to be found in the office because that's going to be nothing but a dead end of disappointment and eventually despair so the man who goes along with this just because she wants to go out and work. You're not doing your duty to honor and protect her. And that's even if we get through the first point that Elliot brought up, which is that she is interested in marrying someone who earns less than she does, which is very rare. <laughs> Absolutely. We got two more here. I got one uh, from the God. Which God? Elliot, if your daughter, and I'll pose this to you guys too because you have daughters. If your daughter wanted to be a CEO and her hubby wanted her to be a housewife, what do you do? Well, once again, inherent in the question is the solution. If her husband wants her to stay at home, that's his authority to say so. So one of the things that we don't understand in our culture is that a woman is under her father's authority until she's married. It's not the same way for men, but as long as she's unmarried, and particularly if she's living in his home, that's when the father has a say. 
So before she gets married, you want to have that kind of conversation. Hey, look, I know you like this boy and this boy wants to marry you. You ought to talk about what your roles are going to be. So before even getting to that situation, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get into that situation because I talk about it before. I, don't, I wouldn't allow my daughter to marry a man that was, uh, you know, that was antithesis to the values that are proposed in the home. And I know that sounds crazy, but I just wouldn't give my blessing. I'd say, this is a bad situation. Uh, if she wants to be a CEO, I'd have to rebuke her. I'd say, look, babe, you know, it's, it's probably not a good idea. You can do what you want, ultimately, uh, well, to a certain degree. But once you get married, I have no say. I'm no longer your authority. I might, I might uh, advise your husband. I might advise you both, but there's nothing for me to do. It's her husband's responsibility to speak with her and deal with her in that manner. So not my problem. I was going to make many of those points. That's, that's perfectly stated. All I'll add is my 11 year old, who's very interested in what Steph and I are doing up here. Uh, you know, when we make these shows, particularly when Steph comes on the show, uh, on, on her book, we both have anti-feminism books. We, we went out there the other day. I, I'm always shooting, shooting baskets in my driveway. And the kids play with chalk. And, and the 11-year-old and the two 8-year-old twins, all girls, had done a, a bunch of graffito tagging on our driveway against feminism. And I took a picture of it. And I said, guys, I'm, I'm very proud of this. So if you raise them right, they're not going to want to be uh, a boss babe. And uh, right. yeah, if you raise them right, they're going to they're going to marry a good young man and you're not going to have to be uh, flexing authority. You don't have anyway, because right. once once they're for even by before they get married, really, the father's authority is ending because um, they have the authority to marry whomever they want. Christianity is very clear on this first worldview in the history of the world that says whether a father grants his permission or not. It's a sacramental marriage. Uh, it, it is not required the way it is in some of the other Western faiths. So do your job when they're kids, if you raise them right. The test, the pop quiz is maybe they decide to get married really young. When it, maybe it's a little older. You will know the tree by its fruits. How well did you parent your young girls? Then? Mm. Will, anything to add? No, that's great advice. A lot of people have this idea that the trad dad is going to be saying, no, you can't marry this person. But as Tim has just explained, that's not how it works. You put the work in and then the girl's going to make the right decisions. Right. And it, in this situation, it sounds like uh, it's actually the young lady that needs to be corrected because if the husband wants to keep her at home, well, you know, I would I would side with my son-in-law in that case. I'd say, listen, Listen to your husband. And by the way, I agree with your husband. So <laughs> uh, we got one yeah, more here. Good. And it's uh, written with somebody who probably has fingers the size of potatoes on their cell phone. And I think he's trying to, he's trying to denigrate us in some way by saying turd. But what I think he's saying, which I think is a good way to wrap up the question, not sure if this is what he meant, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> Potato. Uh, is, well, we are talking about the problem, right? And he's got a point if he's, if he's curious. Well, fellas, turds, what is the solution? So maybe we could talk to, uh, you know, besides, you know, raising our daughters right and, and, and speaking to men worldwide, that's what we do. We teach men the right way and we raise our daughters the right way. I think in terms of raising my daughters so that the young men that I mentor will have good wives and I, and I mentor the men so that my daughters will have good husbands. But besides, you know, inside our own homes, what are some good solutions that maybe uh, are practical for the people that are watching this? How do we overcome this if we see its error? Well, I, Elliot, you know, I, I actually was Steph and I were speaking uh, briefly with your wife, Colleen, the other day by text. And I was about to ask Will at the end of the show uh, to, to be able to contact his wife because Steph, my wife, recently ran the first ever Ask Your Husband Women's Summit where she had on 
six other women, all, uh, there's at least one representative in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it went really well. People should nice. go watch that because although women are commanded by Holy Scripture not to ever teach in the church or not to ever command any authority over men, all over uh, Timothy and Titus, in Titus, remember, women are said, the, the people you can teach are younger women. What, what are they supposed to be teaching them? How to care for the home and how to love their husbands better. And so this is what the Ask Your Husband uh, Women's Summit, the first one was called No Such Thing as Halfway Cooks, after the old uh, 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 famous, famous hip-hop song everyone knows from the beginning of 8 Mile, No Such Thing as Halfway Crooks. Um, it went well. It went very, very well. You can go see that Women's Summit on my channel. We're going to do another one in late summer, and I wanted to invite uh, Mrs. Hulse and Mrs. Noland to, to join Steph on that one. Uh, and that, that's part of the solution here, too, is not just men taking onus for all things like false heroes. Women have to take the onus for how heinous they've become under you know, the auspices of the sexual revolution. And this means women instructing other women. Women that actually know what the hell they're talking about, like our wives, need to kind of put it out there. And, yes. and Steph has by writing a book and then, and then trying to instruct young women. We get multiple dozens of emails a day on this and she does her best. Amazing. S scared to death, scared to look, they shook. <laughs> Ain't no such thing as a halfway crook. <laughs> halfway crook, yeah. Yeah. Next that's, song I write might it, be though. about I, you. I, <laughs> yeah. Mob beat, baby. Yeah. No, I like beat. that though because the uh, the real power is in making them look. And uh, St. Francis of Assisi said that you preach the gospel using words if necessary. So if you just go out there with a happy wife with lots of kids, that's making people look. And it's a frightening thing for people who've been told that there's no happiness there possible to actually see. You've got a, a woman who's glowing with a big family, who's being provided for and protected by her husband. That's the most powerful way in which you can actually bring people over to the truth. So there's a sense in which talk is cheap, isn't it? And of the writing of books, there's no end. And you've got to actually make it flesh and blood and real. And that's what women do in a way that men can't and they can bring their own kind of testimony to the beauty of it. So I've found that That's right. even with friends who, um, you know, we've spent time with them and then uh, they haven't got kids. And then a few months later, it's like, oh, you're expecting. Great. That's and right. I know why it is. It's because they've been shown that it's possible and it's beautiful. That's right. Yeah. Showing them what's possible. Yep. That's huge. I agree. So a woman's place is inside the home. Fellas, we assert that my guests agree. And uh, we give ample reason as to why that has been the church teaching from the beginning and why we've been subverted as a culture and this uh, feminist idea that there's somehow, uh, it's somehow good for women or men for women to work in the workplace or to work outside the home in the workplace is erroneous and it's diabolical and it disorients our entire culture. But I'd love to hear what you guys got to say. Comment down below. Let us know what you think about women working in the uh, outside of the home. Is it good for society? Is it good for women? Do they really want to do that? Or is there another way, a traditional way, the traditional Catholic way? Fella, so that's it. Anything to add before our parting words, uh, Will, Tim? Yes, yeah, she... she uh... She needs to stay in the home because she's too good for anywhere else. Amen. That's and I would right. just say that I, my, my parting shot would be that the thesis of, of my book, The Case for Patriarchy, uh, intoned on the second page of the book, that feminism is the proto-gender uh, dysphoria. Before mm. Skittles, before, before trans, you have the philosophy underlying it. This thesis is being popularized right now by uh, Michael Knowles, who, who read the book. It's, it's, he's been everywhere saying it, and even by Matt Walsh. So I did not think that it would turn around within a year and a half and be getting so popular.
So people should convert right now uh, before they end up looking like Johnny come lately to this this movement. I've been really pleased with the way that the case for patriarchy has been popularized. I did not expect it to. I expected to be vindicated much later. And conservatives are turning around and saying a thousand times more subversive than Skittles or trans is something that affects basically all households. And that's feminism. That's getting women out of the home, which is really what feminism is. Women are private and belong in the home. Feminism told us the opposite. And it led to all these other perversions, which aren't nearly so toxic. Amen. Yeah, Thank for you. sure. The, uh, it's a smokescreen. LGBTQ is just a smokescreen for the really important stuff going on behind the scenes that mm -hmm. most people are scared to talk about. And Tim's book did it first. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see the popular culture uh, turning their head finally. I think they say that the truth doesn't have to be defended, it will defend itself. And so ultimately, you're just proposing truths that have always been true. And of course, they'll rise to the top.